production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences. This time on Broad and High. May is pinch flat season when 30 graphic designers unite to celebrate the art of bicycling. I just thought it'd be kind of cool to kind of create, you know, what would a, a cyclist utopian lifestyle look like? Meet a young artist whose work will soon hang in the U.S. Capitol building. My work was called Reflections. I just tried to capture different emotions in each of the portraits. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Manicky. Take 30 graphic designers who together create a total of 30 original prints celebrating the art of bicycling, and then sell them each for $30 to benefit a local arts organization. That must mean it's pinch flat season. Check it out. So May is Bicycle Month every year, that's a national designation in May. Pinch Flat is a community collaboration and a bike poster show. So a Pinch Flat is when you're, you get a flat tire, your tube gets a flat tire from getting pinched between the rim and the, the um, tire of your bike. Um, but the idea being that um, all of the work that goes into this uh, is flat. It's a flat piece of paper. So it just seemed to tie in really well with the theme. So Pinch Flats uh, was started six years ago um, as a collaboration between uh, designers, artists, and the love of bicycles. We have 30 uh, Ohio designed posters included on the show, all of which celebrate bikes and cycling. We have 30 posters uh, with 30 prints each that each cost $30. So you only have to have one number in your head. My background, I've been doing graphic design for about 20 years almost, about 20 years. My inspiration for this year's event, I, uh, my wife and I actually took a few days and we went to New York a couple years ago. I love the old buildings, I love the fire escapes and just the, that, that ur more urban life. This is Scout, she's, uh, she's head of hospitality around our, our, uh, our firm here. There's, there's been a lot of artists that kind of create art that's based on kind of their utopian idea of life. Um, and you know, whether it's Norman Rockwell um, and others, and it's, it's to me, I think when you think of like an urban cyclist, the idea that you could, everybody kind of lives in the same building, they all have the same ideals, they have a coffee shop downstairs and a fresh market right there. Um, the, the roads have, uh, are, are bicycle friendly, it's bicycle parking only on the sidewalk, and I just thought it'd be kind of cool to kind of create, you know, what would a, a cyclist utopian lifestyle look like? So that was kind of my idea behind it. I always start out on paper, and so a lot of the stuff I do will start with little thumbnail sketches, little drawings, trying to get the, the figures and the, and the objects where I want them to be. Um, and then I scan them into my computer, and I go into Illustrator, and I retrace and redraw all the characters and the figures. These are screen printed, so they have to be printed in solid colors. So um, trying to determine where certain colors go and how they're gonna separate out for the screen printer. And then once that's done, it's a matter of just getting the files set right and then sending them off to the screen printer, and then she takes care of it from there. Pinch Flat is the first Saturday of May every single year. We start out at Wild Goose Creative, 
And then in the afternoon, I think right around four or five, we close down the, the gallery that is at Wild Goose and we truck everything down to Paradise Garage. So it's a kickoff for bike month. Um, for us, it's just kind of a kickoff for bike season in general. People are ready to come out and ride in the beginning of May and we um, look forward to it every year. I really love that the people in the creative world in Columbus, whether they're graphic designers or photographers or illustrators, are real collaborative. Um, they, they tend to really um, support each other and recognize that when, when one person does good work, it really elevates all of Columbus's creative community. This year's Pinch Flat posters will be on display till the end of May at Paradise Garage in the Short North. You can learn more about this annual bike poster event at pinchflatcolumbus.com. And here's another annual art event, but instead of bikes, this one celebrates the work of high school students across the country. Young artists from every congressional district in the nation, and there are 435, compete for the chance to have their work on display in the U.S. Capitol Building in Washington, D.C. We met up with the winner of the 15th Congressional District right here in Franklin County. So the Congressional Art Competition is a, a competition that's been around uh, a long time and it uh, allows high school students to submit art and one winner from every congressional district has their piece of art hang in the Capitol um, every year for a year. There are 435 congressional districts in the country. We had um, 265 pieces of art from um, 27 schools in seven counties at our art competition this year. Oh my goodness. Uh, how many art submissions did we get this year? Oh, I mean over 200 from uh, dozens of different schools. So we have some Columbus schools, we have some suburban schools north of Columbus, east of Columbus. Uh, we go up all the way to Mansfield. We go out to Zanesville on the eastern side. So we have a pretty diverse collection of, of school districts that have participated in seven counties in the district. We have artwork from some 19 schools in my district. So from the Columbus School District to Whitehall to Reynoldsburg to uh, Grove City, so we have 29 municipalities. I can tell you we had 184 pieces of artwork. It's the largest number of artwork that we've had in the time that I've been in Congress. Uh, Joyce Beatty and Pat T. Berry and I do our competition together. That's something that we've worked really hard to uh, do it as a community and do it at the Columbus Museum of Art so that these high school students that are building portfolios and might want to be artists can say, I had a piece of art displayed at the Columbus Museum of Art. I mean, how cool is that when you're in high school? And we're going to announce the winners tonight. Our first place winner, piece of title of the bell, Amanda Baugh, a senior at Old Tangy Warren High School. My work was called Reflections and it was a pencil drawing. Uh, I just used graphite and it's two portraits and I guess they're overlapping, so four portraits maybe of uh, two different people that I know and I just tried to capture different emotions in each of the portrait. I really like drawing um, and I'm trying to experiment a little bit more with painting. I do a lot with watercolor, but I just think drawing is very 
calming and relaxing and so it's easy to just zone out while you're doing it and think about other things and that's really nice. It's almost like a meditation kind of thing. My dad's actually in graphic design and then my grandfather's an architect so it's kind of like a family thing. It's, there are a lot of people in my family who do something with art. So I've always known it's kind of something that I wanted to do too. The first place winner has an incredible opportunity. Their portrait will be flown to Washington, D.C. It will hang in the United States Capitol. They will actually get to come to Washington with their sponsor or parent or grandparent and go through a thank you program from the White House and spend the whole day in Washington. But it's a great way to really highlight the work of these young, incredibly talented artists. I think the arts is so important in education because it spurs creativity, it makes the young, talented students focus on releasing their artistic capacity through several mediums of art. So whether you're doing charcoal or paint or photography, it's all a part of your vision and your imagination. And I think it should be included in every public educational curriculum. We're so excited for Cassidy. She's a great artist and uh, I hope everybody will come to Washington and see her piece of art hanging in the Capitol. Don't worry if you can't make it to the nation's capital. You can see all the winning artworks from each district on the U.S. House of Representatives website. Visit house.gov and search for art competition. With spring here and summer approaching, what's better than sitting on your porch with a good book? And maybe you get your books like I do from the library. But do you ever wonder how the system really works? Who orders the books? And why are there only two copies of the latest Harry Potter? Well, we asked to go behind the scenes at the Columbus Metropolitan Library to find out how all those books are managed. at the Operations Center, which is located in Gahanna, and this is the Technical Services Department. And this is all of the materials that end up on the shelves at your local library. So all the books, all the DVDs, all the books on CD, all the music, it all comes through here. These are new, these are replacements, these are your favorite title from when you were a little kid, or the hottest bestseller that just came out yesterday. Our goal is that if it arrives on Monday morning, by Wednesday morning, it is at a location ready for customers to use. We have a goal of 48 hour turnaround time for all materials. And we hit that fairly regularly. <music> 48 hours in the library world as turnaround time for a tech services department is kind of unheard of. So we're, we're a little bit famous for that. About 10 years ago, our turnaround time was much different. We were at something more like 17 days. And so we spent a lot of time looking at how many times do we touch an item? Because if we have 450,000 items come through the department, it might seem like not a big deal to open the book to put the barcode inside of it, but 450,000 times over the course of the year, that adds up to be a lot of time. That's part of the reason we broke up the line the way we did, that we have labeling, linking, styling separately. At a lot of libraries, um, staff work off of carts. And you take your cart and you go to your cubicle, and you do everything to the item. And what we found is that if you divide it up and you're consistently doing the same thing over and over again to the books, it goes faster. I'm a selection librarian. Uh, my coworkers, there's four of us that are full-time that do nothing but select the materials that are added to the library's collection. It's an art, not a science. Um, you just try to make your best guess of what is going to appeal uh, to the widest range of people. Uh, there's about 400,000 titles released in the U.S. every year, and the library adds about 30,000. So we order just a small piece of the pie that's out there. 
In addition to keeping up with the new materials that are coming out is we have to keep track of the old classics that are still popular and still being read. You know, people are still reading um, The Diary of Anne Frank. They're still reading. There's always a new generation of readers for the Dr. Seuss books, for example. So in addition to keeping track of the new materials, we have to make sure that we have fresh looking copies of the old materials that are still in demand. I do a little bit of everything. I work at the unpacking station. Mostly I'm at distribution, sending the books out to the branches. But I work all the stations in between too and take on special projects. This is the labeling station where we apply the barcodes to the books. Um, we put on new stickers, which indicates which month they arrived here, if that's indicated on the, the form. Any reference materials get additional reference stickers and electronic things stuck in them. Then we send them on down to linking, where the barcodes are linked into the system. To be a sorter, it means we distribute all the books for the Columbus Metropolitan Library and partner branches. They come from all over the system. We have a floating collection, so all books that are in transit come to us. So, and that's, we sort everything. You're a bit of an unsung hero because people absolutely have no idea where their books come from. Even people from within the system don't have any sort of clue where or how things operate within the system. And transportation and is, is a backbone of the system. Absolutely, it's a backbone. So in the afternoon, you know, we shut down and all the things that we have sent during the day out to our transportation departments are in stacks, big, huge um, piles of boxes, and they are loading those onto trucks and doing delivery routes to all of our CML locations and then also all of our Central Library Consortium partner libraries. and drivers are driving all night, every night, to be sure that materials are turned around quickly, which goes back to that desire to have things turned around in 48 hours for reserves. I think there is this interesting thing happening right now where customers are still reading a lot of print. There are still the Luddites like me who you have to pry it out of my cold dead hand, but there's also a lot of people who, who love their E. I mean, to be able to load 10 books on my, on my iPad and take it on vacation with me is tremendous, but we are still seeing a huge amount of materials come through this department. I mean, 450,000 items a year is a lot that are going out into our locations. So I think we're developing this balance right now, and we're, we're not sure where it's going to go, but we still see a lot of print and a lot of demand for print. The newly renovated downtown branch of the library is scheduled to open back up next month. A grand celebration will be held on Saturday, June 25th with lots of entertainment, including a concert in Topiary Park and an outdoor movie. Visit columbuslibrary.org for details. Now we head to Kettering, Ohio, where architect Terry Welker builds large-scale kinetic sculptures that dramatically transform the spaces they occupy. His elegant mobiles are inspired by nature, and they appear to have the grace, beauty, and movement that the natural world offers. I'm an architect sculptor. That's what I do. I make art and I find a way to integrate it into the places that we live. Most of my works began as part of a series. Usually they began as experiments. I begin to play. I just am trying things. There's a high failure rate, but eventually things unfold with that. Usually I'm using very inexpensive materials and as I unfold those ideas, I began to formalize it somewhat more to create a larger piece. And then, if things are really working well, it turns into a series. I'm fascinated by the sense of natural order that we find in plant forms. I'm also pleasantly surprised and envious of the ability to create a sense of chaos. And so, I'm always floating between those two worlds of creating something pure and abstract and beautiful in a certain sense, but also 
trying to engage the messiness of the world at the same time. So playing with order and chaos is a constant battle for me uh, in my own art. Sometimes in the studio, happy accidents occur. I will find a scrap of material that evokes a memory for me. I found a long, slender shaving of bright green material, and it reminded me of the color of grass on a summer morning with the dew on it. When the sun hits it, it's almost a yellow-green. So I tried to figure out how to make a mobile as light and as slender and as minimal as I could. How do I make something not to mimic grass, but to evoke the feeling of grass through color and form? So it's not a direct adaptation, it's really an abstraction of that in order to make the sculpture. The consent began with a long time fascination I've had with ginkgos. There are a lot of ginkgo trees in the Dayton area, and so I'm always observing these leaves, partly because I love their color. I love it every year when they fall. I'm the guy with the plastic bag scooping them up so I can spread them out in the studio just to look at them and study them. It's become an iconic shape for me. I had this opportunity for an installation at the Rosewood Art Center, and I enjoyed the idea of taking that shape and making it as large as I could within a sculpture. And I wanted to fill a room with a sculpture that would be an experiential event, because when you see something in mass, I want people to sense it with their body, not just with their eyes, but really to experience it in a larger way. But I also related to this wonderful poem by Howard Nemiroff, where he tells the story about how ginkgos, almost by consent, drop their leaves all at one time. I thought it was important in that space, too, to engage children, so I created this big mass of pillows in the shape of ginkgo leaves. Public art seemed a natural thing for me. Maybe it's because I'm an architect. I do lots of gallery shows, but the public art seems to be more significant in the sense that it's made for a particular time and place. Size and scale is really critical when you're working with sculptures inside a building because if it's too large, it's gonna feel crowded and out of place. If it's too small, it gets lost and feels diminutive. What you want is this sort of perfect sense of fit so that you couldn't imagine the place without it. So you feel like you can enjoy the work and engage it without being dominated by it. Fractal Rain for the Dayton Metro Library downtown has evolved over time. It started off at one size and now it's actually stretching out. It's gonna be about 35 feet tall and stretch out over a length of about 100 feet on two long giant cables. The rain portion of it will be comprised of six foot long wires that are made of stainless steel. And each six foot long wire has a six inch long prism. When you combine all these together, there will be 4,000 wires and prisms that comprise the sculpture. So the appearance is one of a gathering and waning storm. The memory that's evoked by this helps us to remember that as beautiful as rain can be, it can also lead to flooding, which is a big part of our history in Dayton. People are always surprised by the ability to make things balance. It's a really tricky business. An eighth of an inch here or tenth of an ounce someplace else makes a big difference in form. Because when I'm balancing things, I'm not just looking at the forms and whether they balance at all, but I'm looking at the size and shape of the spaces between the forms. A good friend of mine has asked me to consider helping out at the STEM school. And when I'm teaching students they're usually surprised how difficult it is, but also pleasantly surprised by the fact that they can actually learn how to do it. One of the things that's unique about teaching an art class is that it's unlike a math class where you have 25 students looking for one answer. We have 25 students looking for 25 answers, and that's fun. People are often surprised that I don't draw these in advance or that I don't use math to make them. It's really a completely intuitive process. I'm working three-dimensionally the whole time because that's the only way that I can really determine how the final behaviors and compositions are going to unfold. And I might start one direction and change completely midstream. Sometimes 
it ends up being a dismal failure and I have to start all the way over from the beginning. But that's okay. I always say that there's as much on the floor of the studio as there is in the air. That's just the nature of the process. ColumbusMakesArt.com is Central Ohio's most comprehensive source for arts and cultural events. Be sure to check it out to find great things happening around town this week. That's our show. You can watch all of these stories and more at WOSU.org. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing today's show with the music of Columbus's very own Mojo Flow. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week on Broad and High. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences.